Thank you very much. Um, and really thank you uh, for inviting me, um, Masha and uh, FX, I'm really honored. Um, so today I'm going to talk about variational gradient with local linear model. So this is actually one of uh, our, our ongoing work with uh, Jack, Mingxuan and uh, Mark. Uh, so because of this ongoing nature, uh, maybe you will see something that is uh, uh, not uh, 100% you know, accurate. Uh, but I, you know, we, we definitely welcome your feedback and uh, comments. And actually, so why, I just want to quickly comment, why am I interested in this research? It is because um, doing teaching. So I wanted to explain this idea, which is I'm really, the thing I'm really passionate about, sign vari variational gradient descent. I think it is really elegant and remarkable algorithm. So I try to explain it to our students. Uh, however, this is a concept really difficult to teach. Um, for a, it's not, uh, you know, so sign variational gradient descent. So variational, it's relatively easy concept. Many students heard of variational autoencoder, so they know it's something to do with Kubeck library divergence and the minimization of Kubeck library divergence. Gradient descent, they understand is something related to optimization. So these two things they are relatively uh, familiar with. But the really hard part is to explain what is uh, Stein. What does the Stein in Stein variational uh, gradient descent means? And actually, this is the starting point of uh, sort of my work that I try to put SVGD under a slightly different framework. And so that is kind of more intuitive and easier to explain to my students. And then along the way, uh, we discover something interesting. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. So first of all, let's talk about the problem setting because I work on uh, density ratio estimation and I'm really bought into this, you know, uh, minimizing the distance kind of thing in machine learning. So I basically frame everything in machine learning as a minimization of some kind of uh, statistical distance. Let's consider two distribution P and Q. Uh, we have observed information from distribution P and we want to approximate P using another distribution Q. And in many cases, we want Q to be uh, easy to interpret, easy to compute, easy to sample, right? Or all of above. Um, if you choose, for example, Q as a Gaussian distribution, then it tick all the boxes, right? Um, so how do we find uh, such an approximation? So usually we choose Q that minimize kind of uh, statistical distance, which is also the topic of this workshop, right? And indeed, many interesting machine learning problems or statistical problem can be framed under uh, this big umbrella, like maximum likelihood estimation, variational inference, uh, generative modeling, and many more, right? So let me see if I can hide my, uh... oh yeah, it's gone, okay, good. <clears throat> so let's consider maximum likelihood estimation or MLE. So in this case, what is the observed information of my distribution P, the thing I want to approximate? And in this case, I have a set of observed samples X. And Q in this case is our density model Q theta. Usually I have you know, a parameterized model. So then uh, I can change the model behavior by changing theta. And how do I determine uh, what Q to choose? Again, I, mini I minimize some kind of divergence or discrepancy uh, or distance between P and Q. In maximum likelihood, it is the Kubeck library divergence between P and Q. Oh, this little p and little q means the densities of P and Q. So indeed, Kubeck library divergence solve this minimization problem with respect to the parameter theta of your model. And indeed, if you write down the Kubeck library divergence and approximate it using samples, and then uh, you will get the exact same form as the classic traditional maximum likelihood estimation. So now you have a maximum likelihood estimation framed as a Kubeck library divergence minimization problem. Okay, and how do we solve this maximum likelihood estimation? Um, as I mentioned, since Q is parameterized by theta, then we usually do gradient descent in the parameter space, right? So we start from some initial parameter theta zero, and then in the space of my parameter, I'm going along a trajectory along which the Kubeck library divergence reduces. And that is uh, the gradient descent in the parameter space for solving maximum likelihood estimation. And these lines are actually contour lines. The contour lines 
of the uh, level set of the Kubeck library divergence. Okay, so this is how we do maximum likelihood uh, by optimizing the parameter. However, considering uh, this parameterized distribution Q theta, we are restricting ourselves to a, a parametric family, which is not necessarily flexible enough for realistic uh, data sets. Therefore, we are thinking about doing something different, right? Not using some very restrictive model of Q theta. What can we do? Can we replace Q theta with a neural network model, which is uh, you know, proven to be very flexible and adapt to many real, real world problems? You can, but then in this case, uh, Q theta won't be normalizable as I think the second talking today, uh, he, he mentioned, the speaker mentioned this uh, issue and how to solve uh, this unnormalizable density model is another line of research. Indeed, uh, this line of work includes, for example, score matching, uh, noise contrastive learning, and uh, minimum sign discrepancy proposed by Barb and uh, FX and myself, uh, uh, Stein, uh, uh, what is that? <laughs> Stein uh, intractable model inference, uh, 2019. <laughs> it just, uh, I remember other people's work sometimes better than myself. Okay, so as I mentioned, if you choose Q theta to be a really flexible neural network model, then you'll have to deal with this uh, intractable model issue. Uh, is there an alternative approach? And let's consider this optimization problem, which again is minimizing Kubeck library divergence, but Q is no longer a parameterized model. It is um, just a density function Q and the optimization domain has changed to the probability space, the space where all probability uh, models defined on uh, RD is contained in that space. And indeed this space is really rich and uh, it is, you know, much more flexible than restricting ourselves in a space of theta, right? So this is a really kind of a flexible um, uh, candidate space for us to search our approximation. Then the question is, how do we optimize this problem? Because, you know, if you have a parameter, I can do gradient descent, right? But if I have, you know, this uh, minimization problem with respect to Q within this probability space, how on earth am I going to do the optimization? Actually, it turns out it's exactly the same as you did in the Euclidean space, or oh, sorry, in the parameter space. So imagine a path or a gradient flow, QT, which is a trajectory in this probability space. And now you see this space is no longer theta, but it is a space of probability, right? And we start from uh, some point, and in this case, one point is one probability distribution. And then we follow a trajectory uh, characterized by QT along which the Kubeck library divergence reduces, which is exactly the same thing we did in the parameter space, but now we're doing it in the probability space. And this probability, sorry, this gradient flow or the path uh, can be characterized by a differential equation uh, partial TQT equals to VT, where VT is some function depending on the thing I want to minimize. So if I want to minimize Kubeck Leibler, I get, a T, uh, I get a VT, a different divergence, I get a different VT, right? So basically uh, my trajectory or gradient flow is characterized by this differential equation. So is, this, is this due to the fact that you're now optimizing the probability space or you can optimize the case in the, in the parameterized space? Right? You can, yes, you can, have the, you can have gradient flow in Euclidean space as well. Yes, absolutely. And so just looking at this, you still probably don't know how do I optimize, uh, how do I you know, uh, follow this trajectory to optimize QT, right? Um, so there is a really important link here. So let's represent distribution P and Q by their samples, and let's call these samples particles. You can imagine you know, these are particles that uh, are just the samples from distribution P or from distribution Q. And then let's consider what does that mean uh, when we are optimizing the probability, or oh, sorry, the gradient flow in the probability space. It turns out that the differential equation 
that characterize the gradient flow in the probability space also implies an update rule for our particles in the sample space. So this is a really important link because now I am able to translate the uh, gradient flow in the probability space to the particle space, to the sample space, right? And now I have this uh, differential equation, which is the xt equals to ut xt dt. So now the uh, trajectory of my particles is determined by this differential equation. And this link between the trajectory in the uh, probability space and the trajectory in the uh, particle space uh, is governed by uh, Volker Planck equation. Okay, so now I translated from this differential equation to uh, this ODE in uh, the sample space or in the uh, data space. Okay, and why this is important because if I have samples from my distribution, then I can basically update my samples following this ordinary differential equation and then uh, reaching or approximating the target distribution. So you can think that I start from this position x0, where x0 is drawn from some arbitrary distribution like Gaussian. Then I just uh, update my particles following this ordinary differential equation, and then I will move my particles closer and closer to uh, the target distribution until you know t equals to infinity, uh, we will uh, perfectly approximate the target distribution, p. Okay? So in this case, I'm moving in the uh, particle space, but in the previous case, I'm moving in the probability space. Okay. Um, so this actually is a really, uh, very, really interesting topic and very hot in machine learning right now. If you're interested, uh, I recommend uh, ICML 2022 uh, 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 tutorial talk, and they you know, went into much further in detail and explained this much better than I just did. Okay, so without going into much technical details, you might wonder, in order to minimize my correct LIBOR divergence between P and the Q, what is the update rule of my particles? And this has been, you know, studied uh, by lots of people. And I can tell you this update rule is actually nabla x p divided by q, where density uh, p of x is density of distribution p, and q uh, is the distribution of my particles. And the reason uh, we have qt here is because I'm moving my particles along the trajectory. Therefore, this t is just the time index. And this is just for Kubek library divergence uh, between p and the q. What about you know, other divergence measures? It turns out that other divergence measures have also uh, been studied under this kind of uh, gradient flow framework. Suppose uh, this RT uh, is defined as the ratio between P and my particle distribution QT. And then the F divergence can be written in this way. And then the update rule of my particle can be written uh, in this, uh, in this uh, expression. And this is RT times second order derivative of RTX times the gradient of RTX, okay? This is the general update rule for uh, all differentiable, second order differentiable F divergences. And here I just give you a few examples uh, of those F divergences. First, we have KL, P to Q, and then we have reverse KL because KL is not symmetric. Then it's KLQ to P. And finally, we have chi square uh, P, uh, PQ. Okay. And you can see their update rule always associated with the gradient of the ratio between two density functions. This RT, remember, is the ratio between P and the QT. They all depend on the gradient of uh, my ratio function. So these are the update rules. And then, you know, the practical algorithm for minimizing that, you know, uh, complicated Kubeck library or whatever minimization problem I have earlier, then is just sample x0 from 
initial distribution Q0, and then follow the update rules corresponds to the F divergence I picked. And this eta here is just a small step size. And then the distribution of your particles will approach to the target distribution P as the time goes to infinity, right? So that is how we do uh, the particle optimization to minimize the F divergence. And uh, so now it's really nice, right? We have basically done our job, right? We can uh, approximate a really complicated distribution P uh, using Q from a really rich space, right? From the probability space represented by our particles, right? So everything is done, but not so fast because all the update rules I have shown you earlier depends on one thing, that is the ratio between P and QT, the target distribution divided by the particle distribution. And the particle distribution evolves over time, right? And this thing is really complicated. And because, you know, you are evolving particle, you know, uh, based on some very complex particle dynamics. So there definitely isn't a closed form for QT. Even if I know what PT is, I would not be, you know, I would not possibly know what QT looks like. Therefore, this RT, uh, you know, is intractable to me. And if you consider the earlier maximum likelihood setting, we don't even know the expression of P2, because as I mentioned, we only observe samples from distribution P. So this is uh, the first challenge to us. However, we're saved by this, um, you know, very popular machine learning algorithm called density ratio estimation. So this algorithm says, give me samples from P and Q, I can approximate this ratio for, okay? So I can approximate this ratio case uh, based on samples from P and Q. Then once I observe the approximation of ratio, I just take the derivative with respect to my input, my input variable X, okay? But the problem is a good density ratio estimator, not necessarily a good density ratio gradient estimator. So here is an example uh, where the red uh, curve is the estimated density ratio. It's illustrative. I, you know, I just draw it by hand, okay? So um, the red curve is the estimated density ratio and the blue curve is the true density ratio. And you can see both of these red curves are decent estimation of the ratio in terms of the least square error because they are reasonably close to the true density ratio. But clearly the one above, it's a much inferior gradient estimator because the, the gradient goes up and down, up and down, right? It gets the slope completely uh, wrong, right? So that is a much worse gradient estimation than the one below. So that indicates the density ratio estimation method that we already have may not up to the task for estimating the gradient of the density ratio. So then the question is, how on earth am I going to estimate the gradient of density ratio? So here is the first important observation. That is, there already exists a decent density ratio gradient estimation estimator, and it was not proposed for such a purpose. And this estimator is called Stein Variational Gradient Descent, SVGD. And just to, you know, to, to uh, mention the previous literature, the link between SVGD and the gradient flow has already been known for a really long time. And there were lots of previous work. But what I'm going to talk about is slightly different from their take about SVGD as a gradient flow um, method. So, okay, let's have a, a, a look at the uh, second part. Oh, I <laughs> have to maybe hurry up. So, okay. So let's first talk about a really, really naive uh, or classic uh, statistical method for approximating things, Nadaria Watson estimator. So from now, I'm going to ditch all the T's because they don't matter. My analysis or... Uh... Oh, no. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Too excited. <laughs> so 
Nadaria Watson estimator uh, is a very classic estimator for interpolating the function values, right? So if I want to interpolate a function f at x0, then I basically just sum over all the function values at all different positions x and weighted by my kernel k. And this k is a smoothing function, for example, RBF uh, kernel smoother. And if the k is normalized, so this is the key. If the k is normalized, then this Nadaria Watson estimator is really good because it is unbiased up to the various order of Taylor expansion of f. For example, uh, sorry, uh, it basically means it gets the height right. And this can be easily verified by taking the expectation of the estimator and then do the Taylor expansion on your f function, right? I won't you know, explain here. It's really very well studied. It's a decent uh, interpolator of a function f. So the question is, can we approximate gradient flows using that Aria Watson estimator? The answer is yes, just replace the function f with uh, the gradient of ratio r. Um, well, here is a little bit trouble because we don't really know r. So we can't really evaluate this Nadaria Watson estimator. But let's just pretend as if we can. You will see this is also a good estimator for the gradient of density ratio. Because again, you analyze the bias and then expand this gradient of r using Taylor expansion. You can see it is unbiased up to the first order Taylor expansion of R, which means it gets the slope or the trend right. To a gradient estimator, this is important because you are getting the slope function uh, correct, right? Ignoring all the higher order terms. I'm not saying they, are, they don't matter, but in many cases, the higher order uh, derivative of function uh, is uh, small under mild assumptions under mild locality assumptions, okay? So you can see this Nadaira Watson is a fairly good estimator. Um, oh yeah. So let's consider the Nadaira Watson estimator for log uh, ratio, the gradient of log ratio. And this is where something interesting happened because you see the log ratio decomposes to log P minus log Q, right? And this gradient of log r decomposed into two terms. And the first term, if I know p, I can always compute this, no problem. But the second term, I don't know q because q, remember, is the particle distribution. So I don't know what q is. However, under mild regularity conditions, integration by parts, you can translate that into uh, this term. And now you can see that Q disappears. It only, uh, it only appears in the expectation. And therefore, you can approximate the uh, gradient of the log ratio or the reverse KL gradient flow using this expectation. And if you know what the P is, this expectation is tractable, can be approximated by samples or particles from distribution of Q. And this thing in the middle is called a Langevin Stein operator. And that's why uh, this operator is called, this gradient descent algorithm is called Stein variational gradient descent. So the, the name of Stein comes from Stein operator. Okay. So this is, you know, um, uh, the relationship between the Stein variational uh, gradient estimation, uh, sorry, Stein variational gradient descent and the approximation of the gradient flow. And this interpretation is slightly different from existing views because in Nadaria Watson, it would require the K to be explicitly normalized, which means that the expectation of the kernel needs to be exactly one. And that is true for all the point that you want to evaluate. And this is something that the classic Stein variational gradient descent doesn't do. But interestingly, they notice the importance of, norm, of you know, uh, normalizing the kernels. And they even mentioned this on how to choose the kernel bandwidth. So the expectation of your kernel is approximately to one. So they did realize the importance, but they didn't explicitly uh, do that. Okay. 
And also, by the way, this normalization is carried out at each particle point for each x zero, which means you can't really, uh, you know, uh, um, replace it with a different learning rate. So you can speed it up or slow it down. So you have to do it, you know, point by point. So here is, um, so yeah, here is the kind of Nadaria Watson interpretation of Stein variational gradient descent. The question is, you know, does this normalization matter, right? And I know the Stein variational gradient descent already works really well. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, I, actually, I just want to show, I just want to show a demo, right? Does it work or, you know, does this normalizing, uh, does this normalization really matter? So here, let me run an example. <clears throat> so this is SVGD without normalizing the kernel. And I choose the uh, step size to be 0 0.1 and run it for 50 iterations. You can see it does go you know, into the high density region of the uh, target distribution. Sorry, target is blue, particle is red. Okay, so the particle does go to the target distribution, but you can see some points are left behind. And this is not ideal. But if I normalize the kernel and still keep the same step size and run for 50 iterations, you can see now my convergence is much more uniform. And this is the difference or the big difference, I would say, between unnormalized SVGD and normalized SVGD. Therefore, in this case, I think, you know, the, uh, our interpretation that SVGD is an Adaria Watson estimator of the gradient flow does seem to work nicely. So that's what I want to show. Okay, so go back to uh, the, okay. Right. Okay, so, so far so good, right? Well, not exactly. <laughs> I have to motivate my research, you know, using something, right? So far, so good. But, you know, SVGD requires a tractable way um, of evaluating this quantity, which means you need to be able to evaluate the gradient of the log density uh, function Px. And we might not have this information, as I mentioned in the previous example in MLE, we only have samples from distribution P. And in generative modeling, I only have, you know, pictures of somebody's faces, right? I don't really know the distribution of a human uh, faces. So in these cases, I don't have uh, the gradient of log P. How can we still perform the gradient flow in this setting? Or is there any other way to approximate gradient flow update without this uh, nabla x log p and using only samples from p and q? And we want this to be as good as SVGD in terms of uh, estimation bias. So it is still first order unbiased. So now it is the kind of uh, uh, second part of my contribution, our contribution approximating gradient flow using local linear regression. Another very classic way of uh, doing function interpolation other than Nadaria Watson is just doing local linear regression, right? And this is a very well studied method as well. And suppose I have phi of x, which is just literally the linear feature, linear feature transform function. And then suppose my f of x evaluated at x zero uh, is evaluated, oh, sorry, is approximated by a linear model. That's, you know, that's why it is called local linear regression because you're approximating the function value uh, using a linear model. But this linear model is only um, uh, estimated locally. So for different X in your data set, you will have to approximate a different linear model. And this, Beta is the parameter of my local linear model. How do I uh, obtain this approximation? So how do I obtain uh, this beta uh, parameter? I simply minimize the weighted least square uh, objective function. And here I have this uh, you know, kernel function. Again, it is a kernel smoother 
In this case, it doesn't have to be normalized and just tells me you know, how much I should uh, upweight or downweight the least square loss uh, of this data point, okay? Weighted least squares. And you can also see this uh, local linear regression is unbiased up to the first order Taylor expansion of F. And this is uh, discussed in uh, Hestie's Elements of Statistical Learning, chapter five. And this does seem to be a really nice candidate for us to approximate the gradient flow locally. And indeed, let's just replace the F function here with the ratio function R of X, and then consider the following local linear regression. Thank you very much. And then we can see the parameter beta is estimated using this local linear objective function. And you can show that this objective function is still tractable. Although I am introducing this unknown function R of X, but in fact, if you expand the square, it's actually not that scary. Everything just boils down to expectation with respect to uh, the distributions. And then uh, you can sample from those distribution, you can approximate those expectations. And this least square without the uh, kernel weighting is actually a very well-known uh, density ratio estimator called least squares importance fitting or ULSIF. Uh, and how do I obtain the gradient approximation of the gradient? Sorry, how do I obtain the uh, gradient approximation? Because now I have approximation of the ratio, then I simply just take the derivative uh, with respect to X of the ratio model. Now, because uh, this feature phi of X is linear in X, then essentially we're just left with beta after the uh, differentiation. And this beta is just uh, our gradient approximation of the gradient flow, okay? And here is the explicit closed form solution for uh, beta. And indeed, if you do the bias analysis, you will see our estimation, our approximation of the gradient is again unbiased up to the first order Taylor expansion of the ratio function. And assuming the higher order moments, sorry, the higher order derivatives of the ratio is small uh, under some local locality smoothness assumptions, then uh, the bias of our approximation is also very small. Okay, so let me just quickly skip the, uh, I just want to run a quick example. Uh, so here, I have, uh, you know, two different distributions. Uh, again, red is the particle, blue is target, but the difference is in this case, I only have samples from the target distribution. And you can see that uh, the gradient flow is able to transport my particles to the target distribution and the approximation is fairly well. And also it follows a relatively straight line so that the transportation cost uh, is relatively low. Uh, oops, sorry, where is my, oh, okay, good. Okay, so uh, how much time do I have? Like eight minutes or? Uh, six minutes till end of talk. And All right. Then I'm going to all right, I see. Okay, so now imagine me in a YouTube video that two times fast. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to talk about, like, you know, quickly mention this uh, idea of doing gradient flow in the reduced dimension. And, uh, you know, basically we're talking about, uh, you know, high dimensional gradient flow here. Imagine I want to generate a picture, right? Pictures are really high dimensional uh, samples. So I can't directly apply my local linear methods to this high dimensional space because I'll suffer from the curse of dimensionality. So here is a, a very important concept that the gradient flow, so here, over here, so the gradient uh, of my ratio function and can be equated to another function R prime, which is another feature transform of my input 
uh, x. And in this case, because it's a composite function, I will have uh, the chain rule. And then the gradient of my ratio function can be translated as the uh, product of the Jacobian of S is the feature transform and the gradient of this ratio R prime in a different space. So suppose S is a feature trans, uh, transform that maps your data set into a lower dimensional space. Then the only thing that you don't know, suppose you already know S, the only thing that you don't know is this part. And this is just a gradient flow in a lower dimensional space. And that is uh, the basic idea of doing gradient flow in a reduced space, that is to find S of X, that transformation that maps your high dimensional uh, objects into a lower dimensional space, okay? I'll leave the details uh, to the, uh, you know, in the, in the, so all the details are in the archive version. Uh, you can easily find it over there. Okay, so finally, I just want to talk about this uh, uh, ex experiment that we have done. It's called uh, Smile Variational Gradient Descent. So basically, I want uh, to approximate target distribution um, using uh, images. So in the, this example, target distribution uh, is images that are smiling, okay? So I want to have uh, images that are smiling, but not using original uh, pictures from the data set. Instead, I want to solve this optimization problem. Basically, I want to minimize the divergence or distance between the distribution of smiling pictures and this Q, which is the uh, particle distribution. So at the start, I initialize Q as the uh, pictures of non-smiling images, and then follow some kind of gradient flow. Hopefully as time goes to infinity, uh, these you know, non-smiling images uh, can be transformed into smiling images. So that's why I'm calling this algorithm a smile variation of gradient descent, also called SVGD, right? So here is the data set. It's a very well-known data set called the Celeb uh, Zero, Celeb A, sorry, Celeb Z, uh, A. And above we have a smiling, uh, pictures below, we have uh, non-smiling pictures. As you can see, that's not really, you know, that uh, clear to us because some of the non-smiling pictures are clearly smiling. Some of the smiling pictures, not that smiling, right? And in this case, we have some complicated issues because curse of dimensionality, the dimension, dimensionality is really high. So in this case, we prepare a feature transform S that is trained by a logistic regression. And then I apply the uh, gradient flow in a lower reduced dimensional space. And here is the result, a kind of side-side comparison between the you know, images I started with, and then at the end or below, I have images that I end up with. So hopefully, you know, the image below is more smiley than the images above. Uh, do you think that the image below is really is more smiling than the image above? I see some people are nodding. Yeah. So if you are doing this kind of find spot the difference a lot, then so actually some obvious cases include this guy, right? So you can compare this guy with this guy, and also this guy with this guy. Okay. And you can also see what has been changed, what has been updated. So this is the approximated gradient uh, in the first iteration. And you can see the update are concentrated on the uh, lower part of the face. So it is a reasonable thing because, you know, I want to update a picture to make it smiley. I would probably concentrate somewhere around my mouth, right? Lower chin part. And here is uh, the result for adversarial examples. Basically, I train a falsifier and then I, uh, you know, produce adversarial examples uh, so that, you know, it can fool the classifier to make it thinking that we are actually smiley images. Uh, these are uh, really smiley images. And you can see uh, this would produce, you know, images that looks clearly uh, like being edited. So not as good as our uh, approach. Okay, 
So here is the conclusion. Uh, I won't bother reading it, but I'm really sorry. Maybe I have run over time. No, really? We have 45 seconds. Oh. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay, in the meantime, I have a question. Uh, right. So you propose algorithm that approximates the gradient that says we can do gradient flow. Right, right. 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 Um, do you know how it does at uh, second order derivatives? I realize it's quite not fair. Yeah. I think in order to consider a second order derivative, you have to use the polynomial, local polynomial regression, mm -hmm. which increase, increases the variance of the estimation to map. So that might be uh, uh, you know, a, a reason, maybe it may not be a good idea. So, but yeah, I definitely feel that you know, there might be a more advanced version than uh, local, uh, local linear regression. So that's my opinion. Yeah. I guess. Uh... Kind of on the topic of the workshop, uh, going back to the start of the talk, where right. you can essentially derive the sort of SCGD for other divergences. Right, right, right. right. Uh, in practice, how do you choose which divergence would be good for that thing? So if you if you just want to use SCGD for you know standard sampling, like in the original paper, let's say, right, right. How, how would you go about choosing a divergence? And should you even go for the, the net divergence or something else? Or, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think um, so. We choose a certain divergence a lot of times, not because the divergence is good, because it is easy to approximate, easy to compute. For example, in the maximum likelihood, we choose KL because it is easy to compute. It is tractable to us. I think a lot of time depends on the tractability issue, and in this specific like density ratio estimation based approach, it depends on how easy it is to estimate the ratio. I think. And if you have, you know, the ratio function um, in some kind of, you know, it, in some cases, the ratio function is really volatile. And if you are directly estimating the gradient of the ratio function might not be a good idea. However, if you estimate the gradient of the log ratio function, then it might be much more mild and therefore much uh, better idea. So I think it comes back down to like computation and also the you know estimation error kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any more questions? I was just wondering when it comes to um one point six, so you have the the gradient of the log of the density. Right. You don't know the density, then you don't know that, but could it be used as sort of score matching by an effective way then? Could it the gradient of the log of density is something like less than density? Right. Then, use that as in lieu of the uh, local linear regression, and then kind of continue this same variation of the same approach. So, you are, so your question is whether I can use kind of score matching kind of idea to estimate the gradient of density ratio? Right, right, right. That's a very good question. So I know, uh, so I, I, have, I have tried, I have tried to write the score matching for density ratio gradient estimation. It was not successful. Uh, so it's not that trivial actually, um, because you end up with like weird terms that you can't really approximate. So uh, it's not uh, immediately doable to me, at least. Yeah. Oh, any any more questions for Frank? Uh, another question. So given uh, how other speakers talked about uh, more robust behavior of KL, right, right. Um, do you think it would show in this family of methods? Like if you, instead of a face, you had a an picture of an animal? Ah, right. That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Uh, so honestly, um, you know, my feelings, this method really shouldn't have worked. This is what I <laughs> um, The reason being, I am reducing the picture to such a low dimensional space, right? I am using this feature mapping to reduce the image to such a lower space. And therefore, there really shouldn't be any sort of facial information left anymore. But the thing is, the way I'm choosing this S is actually sort of lower dimensional manifold that encode the difference between smiling and non-smiling. 
So it remembers the difference between smiling face and non-smiling face. Therefore, you see the updates that are concentrated on the jaw part of the face. Right. And therefore, that's why you can't get an A in the end, because right. this kind of feature mapping already restricted you on this kind of manifold. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, lesson, thanks. Thanks so much, again. Thank you very much. <laughs>